Hi there. Today we will be talking about how the Federal Communications Commission uses mathematical optimization to schedule the reassignment of channels for broadcast television stations in the United States and Canada in order to free up spectrum for mobile use and 5G. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers, Dr. Carla Hoffman and Brian Smith. Dr. Carla Hoffman is a professor at George Mason University in the Systems Engineering and Operations Research Department. Her primary areas of research are combinatorial optimization and auctions. She has consulted to the FCC for many years on analytics, optimization, auction design, and auction testing. She is past president and fellow of Informs. And we have Brian Smith. Brian is an operations research analyst with NCI Information Systems and project manager for the optimization team at the FCC. He has a master's of science in operations research from George Mason University and a bachelor's in mathematics from the Catholic University of America. So I will now turn the presentation over to get started. Thank you and welcome Carla and Brian. Good morning, I am Carla Hoffman. Today, Brian Smith and I will highlight the work that was done at the FCC in recent years. This current work is an outgrowth of our activities related to the incentive auction. We are very excited to be here today and appreciate the enthusiastic sign up for this talk. We hope you will enjoy our lecture. But before we begin, we want to acknowledge some of the many people that have worked on this project and made it a success. They include the current and former members of the FCC optimization team, and especially um, Tony Kuderk, Rudy Sultana, James Costa, and Steve Charbonneau, and the members of the Incentive Auction Task Force, especially Sasha Javid, Mark Colombo, Evan Morris, and Jean Cadu. I need to state that the views expressed here are our own and not those of the FCC. And while some of the information contained herein may be based on public information from the auction, these slides should not be used as a substitute for reviewing the Commission's relevant orders, rules, and public notices regarding the incentive auction and the post-auction transition. Now, let me begin by giving you a little background about the incentive auction. In 2016, the FCC undertook the world's first two-sided spectrum auction. Relying heavily on operations research tools, the so-called incentive auction used a market-based mechanism to reclaim much-needed spectrum to meet the exploding growth in mobile broadband and next-generation 5G wireless services. We did this by offering incentive payments to TV stations to surrender spectrum that they currently use for over-the-air television broadcasting. By any measure, the auction was one of the most successful in FCC history. 175 TV stations agreed to sell their channels for a total of over $10 billion. And we were therefore able to sell 84 megahertz of valuable spectrum to wireless companies. The auction generated nearly $20 billion in revenue, 7.3 billion of which will go to reducing the federal deficit. But the dollars raised in the auction are only a fraction of its lasting benefits. The spectrum that was repurposed will enable wireless carriers to increase mobile broadband coverage and to deploy new next generation 5G services. By some estimates, the deployment of this new spectrum capacity will increase productivity and stimulate the US economy by many billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of jobs. In addition, over 100 of the 175 winning TV stations will continue broadcasting over the auction by over after the auction by sharing channels with other local TV stations. This means that viewers' access to most TV content will not be materially diminished, and that much of the $10 billion in reverse auction winnings may remain in the industry to be reinvested by stations into new content and capital improvements. For these efforts, the FCC refused, received the tremendous honor of being the 2018 Franz Edelman Award winner. We're very proud of this achievement. 
Another accomplishment of this effort was that the FCC has recognized the value of operations research to guide other policy decisions by creating the new Office of Economics and Analytics, specifically charged with integrating data analytics with policy making. Today, we will talk about another activity performed by the optimization team. We were given a new challenge how to repack post-auction the roughly 1,000 U.S. television stations and 170 Canadian stations that were assigned to new channels in this reduced TV band. Now, channels 38 through 51 would be lost to broadcasters, and a plan was needed to assure that during the transition, all TV broadcasts would continue unimpaired by other stations trying to test on their newly assigned channels. Most importantly, the rules required that the transition be performed in 39 months. Could this be done? Prior experience when TV stations transitioned from blog to digital. In, 19, in February 1996, Congress passed a law requiring that the transition of over-the-air television broadcasting convert from analog transmission to digital. With digital transmission, much higher resolution broadcasts could be disseminated with less spectrum. Thus, 18 channels or 108 megahertz of spectrum could be recovered for cellular use. The act proposed that the original transition take place in December 2006. In actuality, the transition was not completed until June 2009. Thus, the broadcasters had 13 years to obtain and install their equipment and to inform their customers about what they needed to do to continue their over-the-air viewing. During this transition period, broadcasters were assigned two channels. Their newly assigned digital channel could be used for the testing of new digital equipment while keeping their old analog channel for broadcasts before the digital switchover date. This made testing and installation issues much simpler. One issue with the digital transition was that viewers needed new converters to receive the broadcast in this new digital format. The government provided coupons to all viewers in order to reduce the cost of purchasing new devices. Interestingly, at the time of the conversion to digital, only 7% of the viewership watched TV using over-the-air antennas since most of the country received broadcasts via cable, fiber optics, or satellite services. Today, the number has jumped to nearly 14%, with almost half of this viewership being an increase in affluent viewers with a median age of 35 having at least one subscription view video service. This is the new generation of cable cord cutters. So the question is, can we simply mimic the actions that allowed for the digital conversion, or are these two transitions very different? We quickly came to the conclusion that the incentive auction transition is considerably more difficult and could not be handled in a manner similar to the TV digital transition. Why? Firstly, there are over a thousand stations that need to move to new channels during the incentive auction transition. Significant interference issues exist because TV stations could no longer have two channels one for broadcasting and one for testing. And over-the-air viewership is rising, and we want the transition to be as easy as possible for viewers. In this transition, the issue is not obtaining a new receiver, but rather that whenever a station changes the channel on which it broadcasts, viewers all need to perform a rescan. Most importantly, the transition needed to be completed within 39 months of the auction's ending. This last issue, that the end date for the transition is dependent on the end date of the auction, made the process of planning and determining how to move broadcasters to new channels even more difficult. 
since we would not know which TV stations needed to move until the auction ended. The National Association of Broadcasters, this is the association that represents the TV stations, argued that the FCC was blindly adhering to a, quote, arbitrary and unfounded, unquote, 39-month deadline above all else. So now let's look at the challenges we face when trying to develop a transition plan. First, if stations in the same region transitioned at a variety of different times, then each time a TV station transitioned, over-the-air TV viewers would have to have their digital receiver perform a rescan to find the new assignments. We therefore concluded that our plan should limit the number of rescans. A benefit of having only a few rescans within a region is that multiple stations would reinforce information about when these rescans were needed. And a shorter transition time means that the wireless carriers would be able to upgrade their services sooner, resulting in cellular users experiencing fewer lost calls, faster downloads, and higher screen resolution. One challenge faced by stations is their need to test new equipment before turning off old equipment. Whether a station needs to coordinate with other stations during testing will depend upon whether it is part of what is called a linked station set. A linked station set is a set of two or more stations assigned to the same phase with interference relationships or dependencies. Stations that are not part of a link set may operate on their pre-auction channels and also test their new equipment without needing to coordinate with other stations. Conversely, stations that are part of a link station set must coordinate testing with other stations in that set. And such stations may need to transition to their post-auction channels simultaneously. To better understand these interactions, consider these the two simple examples. The first, so station A having channel 25 as its pre-auction channel, while station B has channel 25 as its post-auction channel. Clearly, if station B tests by broadcasting on channel 25, it will interfere with the current broadcast of station A. As these chains get longer, coordination among a large group of stations is necessary. An even greater challenge occurs when cycles are present. Look at this very simple cycle in the bottom right of this slide. Here, station A must transition before station B, and station B must transition before station C. But, oops, station C has to transition before station A. Clearly, all three stations must transition at the same time in order to avoid excess interference. The picture on this slide exhibits a single daisy change of dependencies obtained from a simulation outcome of the auction in the eastern part of the U.S. Multiple simulations helped us better understand how and where to break link sets into different phases. These simulations had to consider many alternative auction results since we did not know the final assignment of TV stations to channels until the auction ended. But regardless of the auction result, the methodology for determining a transition plan was needed so that as soon as channel assignments were known, a transition plan could be determined. One collection of simulation runs tested the effect of reducing the strictness of the excessive interference rule. Ordinarily, this rule is set at no more than 0.5% new interference. To some, we wanted it to be raised to something higher. We found that even slight increases in allowable interference during the transition significantly reduce the size of these linked station sets. To determine the resources that might be needed and possibly unavailable at certain times during the transition, we met with manufacturers, 
tower crews, transmitter installers, and engineering planning staff to learn what resources might be in limited supply. We learned from the antenna and transmission manufacturers precisely how quickly they could ramp up production. Similarly, we learned that there were different capabilities among tower crews. The installation of certain antennas on tall towers creates, a significant, it creates significant issues, and only a few tower crews exist who are capable of installing equipment on the highest towers. Some towers are over 2,000 feet. To understand just how high this is, we compare the 2,000 feet of the tallest tower to the tallest building in North America, one World Trade Center. It is 1,776 feet tall at the top of its spire. We learned much from these interactions. And besides being able to view the equipment, one of the optimization team, Rudy Sultana, even got to try on the entire gear used by these high tower crews. From these meetings with the industry and conversations within the FCC, we became convinced that any plan created would need to have the ability to be changed as issues arose, whether the problems related to equipment issues, availability of personnel, or weather uncertainties. So, how is this done? Through a variety of discussions, collaborations, testing, simulations, visuals, and interactions with the public on all aspects of the plan. For the incentive auction, the FCC had created a task force to facilitate communication across the bureaus and offices. This task force continued into the post-auction transition. These discussions led to a far better understanding of the constraints that any schedule must adhere to. We were given the precise location of each of the most complex towers and how many crews existed that could work on these towers. We better understood climate and weather conditions, issues, during what periods, at what locations might hurricanes occur. When would climate issues make it impossible to climb a tower? For example, we learned that in midsummer, it's simply too hot for a tower crew to climb tall towers in Arizona. And also that from late fall through early spring, one cannot get materials up into the closed snow covered mountainous roads in the state of Washington. We were also provided with a likely delivery schedule for antennas, transmitters, and other equipment. Similarly, we learned the priorities of stakeholders. Canada wanted to have its stations transition as late as possible. TV broadcasters wanted very few rescans and warned that they needed flexibility in the schedule. Wireless carriers wanted to be able to use their purchase spectrum as soon as possible. Thus, continuous collaboration among all stakeholders helps set the objectives and the constraints for the optimization models and show the constituents that their concerns were being considered when developing a schedule. We ran hundreds of simulations to both help set the goals and constraints and also to help explain the impact of alternative requests made both internal to the FCC and by the various industries that would be impacted by this transition. We had to consider alternative auction results and how each of these possible conditions would impact the timing and the complexity of the transition. Remember, we didn't know what stations would need to be transitioned to new channels before the auction ended. Visualizations showing how slight changes in the number of stations transitioning in a given phase or the location of the stations in a phase might ease or complicate coordinating, coordination among stations. Because the FCC is a federal government agency, 
all of the complexities, including model formulations and the solutions, had to be painstakingly explained to the public, the wireless industry, the broadcasters, and the manufacturers and installers. Not surprisingly, there were many who were highly skeptical that the FCC could complete a transition in 39 months when the last transition took 13 years. This transparent process helped us to test and to validate our assumptions and processes. And yes, the mathematical formulas of the optimizations did appear in public rulings, notices, and in public workshops. We realized that the interference protection rule of 0.5% was significantly constraining the feasibility of many plans. We therefore used these same models to show that a slight temporary increase in this rule could vastly improve the schedule. Specifically, even small increases in what constituted interference reduced the number of rescans within a market significantly. The change also allowed stations whose equipment resided on complex towers more time to transition and therefore allowed these tower crews more time to reconfigure all such towers. Most importantly, small increases in interference substantially reduced the maximum number of linked stations. Our analysis also showed that this small increase in temporary pairwise interference did not result in significant increases in aggregate interference, as some in the TV industry argued it would. By using real data and providing resulting charts and maps, FCC policymakers became comfortable with increasing the interference protection to 2% during the transition, with a return to the stricter 0.5% interference after the transition. Through this continual testing of alternative plans and the production of our visualization tools to explain the results, FCC policy officials began to feel comfortable with a phased transition schedule. They could see how such a schedule facilitated the efficient use of resources by specifying who would receive resources first if those resources were in short supply. And a phased transition schedule would assist in the FCC creating deadlines that could vary by region, by the complexity of construction tasks, and by other factors the Bureau deemed appropriate. With this background, I will let Brian complete our story by explaining the models that were developed, the resulting phases that were chosen, and the mechanisms that were put in place to monitor and facilitate the transition. Finally, he will provide an update of where we are today and lessons learned. Brian, the microphone is yours. Thanks, Carla. Um, the FCC approved using an optimization model with a sequence of objectives to create the schedule and assign stations to one of 10 phases. We used Garobi to solve all of our optimization models. Our objectives were first to clear stations from the wireless band as early as possible and push the transitioning Canadian stations as late as possible. This helped for multiple reasons. First, it made available the recently purchased spectrum as early as possible. This provides the wireless providers more spectrum to deploy 5G, as you can see in T-Mobile's recent advertisements. It also provides some more flexibility for the TV stations should there be complications. If a station is at risk of not making the deadline, it will be much easier if that station only needs to coordinate with other TV stations rather than having to coordinate with TV stations and wireless providers itching to get those licenses. We also tried to schedule transitioning Canadian stations to later phases. The incentive auction created a reimbursement fund to help pay the transition costs for U.S. stations moving to new channels, but Canadian stations were not eligible for this fund. 
therefore we wanted to give them as much time to make their transition as possible. We also wanted to minimize rescans. If we can have all stations in a market transition during the same phase, then we minimize viewer inconvenience of having to frequently rescan. Stations were required to run notifications to alert viewers of the need to rescan. By having stations transition at the same time, we increased the likelihood that viewers would be aware of the need to rescan. The next objective was minimize dependencies within a phase. We wanted to avoid having stations transition in the same phase with stations where they shared a dependency. So one nice feature of objectives two and three is it forced some regionality to the plan. So that way our limited resources like tower crews, they can spend less time traveling between jobs, having to go from coast to coast, and more time doing the actual work necessary. Finally, we attempted to balance the phases. We wanted to have roughly the same number of stations transitioning in each phase. By, by creating roughly even phases, we hope to create a steady demand on the limited resources, especially tower crews and antenna manufacturers. The constraints used were both to make sure no one violated any FCC rules, like no stations can cause more than 2% interference to another station in the transition, but also established uh, thresholds for our various objectives. So we didn't paint ourselves into a corner with one of the objectives. We limited the number of dependencies that can be assigned within a phase and the number of total rescans that any market could have. So this was the result, 10 phases spread out over 39 months, all stations directed to begin their work on the day the schedule was released, April 13th, 2017. Um, so the first phase ended on November 30th, 2018, and that was more than 18 months after the start of the transition. Each phase had a testing period, that dark blue block, which started at the completion of the previous phase where they could begin broadcasting on their new channel. The testing period for each phase was a minimum of four weeks. For, for many stations, this meant their new channel was available and free from any interference. For stations with dependencies in their phase, they could coordinate their testing and transitioning during this time. All stations needed to be off their pre-auction channel by the phase completion date, but they did not necessarily have to be finished everything by this point. Some stations may have transitioned to interim antennas or may have shared a channel with another station while they continued building out their final antenna. And this is how the stations were distributed to the various phases. Blue are the number of U.S. stations within the phase. Red are any Canadian stations that were assigned to the phase. And the darker colors represent the number of stations transitioning from the wireless band, while the lighter colors are the stations tra transitioning within the TV band. So a couple aspects to note here. Uh, some of the Canadian stations were assigned to phases three and four, the little the pink bars there. Those stations had to transition in those phases because they they needed to move to be able to uh, free up space for the U.S. stations, because those signals uh, are not respecting national borders. Also, there are many U.S. stations transitioning out of the wireless band in phase eight, and phase nine and 10 have few stations transitioning out of the wireless band. So we accomplished that first objective by getting as many stations transitioning out of the wireless band early as possible. This schedule made available most of the wireless licenses months earlier while still using the full 39 months for the overall transition. And here are some examples of the resultant phases. For the most part, we managed to distribute the dependencies across the schedule. There were 883 linked station sets overall, the entire transition, or sets that of stations needing to coordinate with each other due to dependencies within the phase. Uh, the median linked station set size was only three stations, so it didn't require too much coordination for those stations. Uh, these example phases contained our most complicated linked station sets where much of the phase was in a single linked station set. 
So phase four in the Northeast, uh, phase five in the Southeast, and phase six in the North Central US. Uh, we knew these were our most risky phases as these link station sets were off in cycles, so therefore they couldn't have been spread out over multiple phases. And they required everyone to move at once to avoid significant interference issues. Uh, this past fall, we successfully completed each of these phases. Now that we have the schedule defined, we need to make sure we kept to the schedule. These are some of the ways the optimization team supported the FCC and the transitioning stations. The FCC decided to create regional coordinators so that stations had a point person to work with at the FCC in case there were any issues, like having trouble with the paperwork required, the uh, lack of communication of stations within a linked set, uh, those types of uh, complications. So we built the optimization model to assign stations to these regions such that the regions had close to the same number of stations with roughly the same level of difficulty and that the regions were compact. We tried to make sure that all stations in a linked station set were assigned to the same region. Uh, we did not assign them directly by geography, such as the assigning grouping states, uh, because state boundaries weren't incredibly important here. A station based in one state might have most of its audience in a neighboring state and have dependencies with stations in another state. We also realized from the start that the schedule was going to need to change and we had to be prepared to adjust to those changes. There were things we expected. We knew stations would run into permitting issues or that a station would need to build a new tower because their existing tower is unable to handle the new antenna. So here, this is a picture of Mount Sutro in San Francisco. That's a tower that is notoriously difficult because of the large number of antennas located on the tower and its location is right in the middle of the city. Um, and we're happy to report that the stations all completed their transition in a recent phase and they're ready to go. Um, but there were other problems that we didn't anticipate like the coronavirus shutting down all tower crews in the country. When a station needed to change phases, we had to evaluate what this would do to the overall schedule. Was this change requested even possible or did it create too much interference to another station? What does it do to the rescans in the market? Did it create three rescans, five rescans? Did it create new links or even worse, join disjoint link station sets into one big set? Does it delay or facilitate the wireless use? Unexpectedly, some stations applied to move early, and often these stations moving early allowed wireless providers early at, earlier access to their new licenses. In these situations, we need to balance the benefits of getting stations completed early uh, and earlier access to the wireless licenses for consumers with the downside of potentially more rescans in a market. When these requests came in, we could check for the feasibility of the request and more importantly, the feasibility of a set of different requests by multiple stations. If the request caused an issue, we use the compute IIS function to isolate the infeasibility to easily know what rules were being broken. Was it too many rescans? Or did this cr request create a giant link station set in the face? Quickly knowing this allowed us to help find creative solutions. Could an interference agreement between two stations help? If a station requested to move from phase two to phase six, but that caused an additional rescan in the market, we might rec recommend that that station move to a later phase, like phase eight, because there are already transitioning stations in that phase and they could all share a rescan. So where are we right now? Uh, we're in the final phase of the transition, so phase 10, uh, and it has gone amazingly. Over 90% of the stations have successfully transitioned and already some of the phase 10 stations have transitioned. We have two months to go to get the rest. 
What's also impressive is more than 75% of the stations are completely finished all work. They're operating on their final antennas at full power. Um, and many in the industry expected it to take many years after the 39 months for stations to complete their work. During the course of the transition, there have been over 250 phase changes, with changes moving both earlier and later. And importantly, the schedule worked as designed. It allowed us the flexibility to make those changes. We were able to handle when the hurricanes hit. Uh, we were able to evaluate stations using temporary channels or two stations sharing one channel to maintain coverage while antennas were being switched out. And what are some of the lessons uh, we learned in this process? Uh, collaboration was key. We interacted with everyone involved, both internally and externally, and tried to understand what everyone's key priorities were. Going into it, from the optimizations team's perspective, uh, we assumed that dependencies were the most critical problem in the schedule, but this turned out not to be the case. The industry was much more concerned with rescans and resource demands. Our schedule reflected the needs of both the FCC the broadcasters, and the wireless providers. The, that early collaboration set us up for great communication throughout. We had established these lines of communication and the stations, wireless providers, manufacturers knew that the FCC was listening and working with them. When issues arose, we were able to address them quickly. As changes happened, they were communicated on the FCC's website. Each station had a transition had a transition tab on their licensing webpage. We also published data files and maps showing all of the updated phase assignments and link station sets as they changed. Uh, the regional coordinators were also in regular contact with their stations, reminding stations of important deadlines and helping facilitate communication if stations were having difficulty. The FCC also required that stations submit quarterly status reports so we could see if there were any red flags that we weren't aware of, and then we could reach out to these stations using the regional coordinators. We knew from the start that changes would be needed, so we designed the models with flexibility in mind. We built our tools expecting phase changes by spreading the dependencies across the phases individual stations changes could be granted without creating interference. Most markets had two rescans, so we could often make adjustments without increasing the rescans. During the course of the transition, we've been able to modify the schedule to help stations dealing with significant compl complications uh, like the hurricanes and now the coronavirus. I also wanted to highlight a few of the other projects that the optimization team has been working on at the FCC. The team has been responsible for the algorithm testing of all auctions. The commission has been holding many auctions, trying to make a wide variety of spectrum available for 5G services. And we've been tasked with testing the auction platforms to make sure they are following the procedures and rules voted on by the commission. We also built an optimization model to reconfigure some existing licenses so they would be consistent with the modern licensing framework. This allowed the current license holders to main equivalent holdings while freeing up significant amount of high band spectrum for the FCC to auction. That auction was recently completed and raised over $7.5 billion. We also have been helping the FCC revise their broadband data collection process. The current process has been faulted for not being granular enough and the new maps will more accurately show where and what kind of broadband is available across the US. So thanks for joining us today.